Hopefully everybody's having a great week, a great month, are comfortable. I see my guy over here, Miro's in the scarf. He looks good. He looks fresh. You, you look like you're having a, a great day right there, you know? <laughs> I'm in my office. You look like you're in some some sort of resort or something. I'm, 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 I'm comfortable right now. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you, bro. I'm comfortable because you know what guys, this is a celebration of black excellence. And I am so excited that we're able to have this conversation with probably in my opinion, one of the forefront leaders in what we're trying to do with black music, black professionals in Canada, Miro Bala, entertainment lawyer, partner, and uh, the, one of the co-founders of Advance. Thank you so much for taking your time and, and, and speaking with us. Yeah, of course, I'm, I'm excited to do this. So I wanted to uh, break this down into three parts. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this is a season of black excellence, so we want to not just talk about, you know, I think a lot of the time when we do these panels or these discussions, it's always a discussion of what's wrong. I really want to focus on what's right, what, what's great, what shall we celebrate about? And today I want to talk a little bit about you first and the things that we should celebrate about you so people get a little, a little bit of back information about Miro and what he's done and where he's been. Um, then I also want to move into a celebration of where our industry is, as Canadian music, because a lot of the time we spend a lot of time focusing on America and what's happening in the States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to really celebrate and uplift what we've been doing here. And then finally, I want to get into what we've been doing and celebrate advance at its birth and where we're going into it in the, um, in the future. Because from my end as advance, I've been privileged to start working with it. Uh, sorry, with NNF, I've been privileged to work with advance as well. So I want to start off talking about you, giving a little background. I understand that you grew up in Lagos and then moved from Lagos to Calgary. I spent a little bit, I moved, uh, I spent a lot of my child, like early childhood in different places like Germany, Slovakia, then Lagos for a few years. And then, but we mostly grew up in Calgary. We moved there in like 81, um, so it would have been seven at the time. And then pretty much grew up there until I moved out to Vancouver to start doing, uh, doing law school up there. Right on. Yeah. What made you focus, or was your focus immediately into the entertainment business or music? when you got into law or was that something that changed i was i think i was figuring it out but it, it seemed like one of the few areas that made sense for me where it was an area that i was interested in you know i'd always been in, into music and the arts and all of that and it just made sense that this would be a place where i could have a career like the idea of me having a career as like a you know a business litigator or you know something like that or even like a criminal lawyer or whatever it just didn't seem like a thing that i wanted to do you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that was not a thing that I was excited about. But as I sort of discovered what entertainment law was and that that was, you know, a career option and what that looked like and kind of what I would need to kind of, you know, navigate how to how to get there and and, and all that, it became more and more of like, a, this is what I want to do. I didn't have a clear path at the time in terms of like understanding how to make it happen, but it just did seem like, okay, this is something something I could do. I ended up articling at a uh, big downtown firm called Goodman's, which is primarily a, a corporate firm, but it had an entertainment department. So I learned a little bit there through one of the senior partners, Michael Levine, who was very kind and gracious with his time and you know taught me a lot. And then ended up moving to a boutique firm, entertainment firm called Stone and Bramwich in 2002 and worked there with Susan Bramwich, who's the, the head partner there for a few years. And mm -hmm. then joined up with Chris Taylor here in 2006 and the firm's been the firm you know now for just celebrating about to celebrate our i guess our 15th anniversary so for some of you who don't know chris taylor is the uh president for e1 tell me a little bit about that relationship i mean this is someone that took you in i mean now you guys are partners mm -hmm. how is that progression of, of coming in first and foremost and then having that relationship grow and blossom to where it is now yeah yeah and that was and that's you know that's that's a that's been a great relationship i you know i look at chris as one of my key mentors and you know probably the most influential mentor in my in my legal career it was kind of when i first you know started working here with him that i really up until then i think i'd had a good understanding of the legal side mm -hmm. of a contract but not really it was kind of when i started working here with chris 
where we had clients that were in the mix of doing things, you know, and, and those artists, those Canadian artists that American labels were signing or those Canadian artists that all the Canadian labels wanted to sign and, and producers and writers and that feeling of, you know, as, as a young lawyer, you get, you get excited when it's like, oh, you know, I'm listening to the radio or I'm in the club and a track comes on, you're like, that's my artist, that's my whatever, right? You know, and that kind of, that feeling, that excitement that come, mm. comes with that, that kind of, that first started coming in, in the early parts of my career with Chris. And I think that was something that kind of really motivated me to feel like, okay, there is, you know, there is kind of no no ceiling to this. And then yeah. later as our, you know, as our practice grew and we started in it as the Toronto scene developed and then, you know, we were mm. fortunate enough to, uh, work with Drake for a number of years and that and kind of seeing then that success replicated on an international platform with right. our clients, you know, became that much more motivating and exciting and as I well. Mean, and I mean, that period that you were involved in it, that was where you really saw the growth in the, um, especially for black music coming out of Canada. Yeah. You know, the it, it was almost like a perfect storm between law yeah. and it was, it was huge. I mean, it was coming about. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was this that that window when, you know, up until then, it's like, you know, we, we had six. We had examples we could point to of artists that had had success outside of outside of Canada, you know, rappers and and, and, and singers. So whether you're talking about Cardinal, you're talking about Chaos, you're talking about Tamia, Nelly Furtado, you know, all of all of these people in these you icons. Off the billboards right there, boy. How are you running off them billboards like that? <laughs> I love it. You know, you had you had all these you had all these icons, but it wasn't really until Drake popped off, and then after that, when Abel popped off, when you when you had the American music industry really being like, okay, now we have to take Toronto seriously. Where it wasn't, I think before they treated whoever was successful, they just kind of treated it as a random aberration, and they didn't need to care about what was happening in the city culturally. Right. right. It was when that happened, then it was like, okay, Toronto's got a, an actual culture too. We need to pay attention to the culture that's happening in Toronto and what's that about, you know, and all of that, right? And then you had everything that kind of flowed out of there. You had all the OVO stuff with Party Next Door and everything else that they did. You had the EXO stuff. And you had all the independent, you know, producers and writers and and artists that just that have flourished, you know, really in the city over the last little while. It's funny. I took, I took a five year kind of Toronto hiatus to move to Vancouver to, to spend more time with my son. Mm. And, um, he was, he was doing high school. So I, a lot of that sort of the second stage of the Toronto kind of the flourishing of Toronto. I, I, I wasn't here for, I'm only kind of rediscovering that now when I'm, when I came back to the city in, uh, in the summer of 2019. So, so a, when yeah. the boom happened, and, and you yeah. were that obviously from a professional standpoint, did you start seeing? Because I'm sure you were you were dealing with a lot of international labels and individuals. Mm. Did you see that there was we were taken a little bit more seriously? What was your uh, take on how music and Canadian black music was taken from an international perspective? Yeah, well, one hundred percent. I mean, that was those were the times when you would I would start to get calls from American A and R's instead of the other way around. Like mm -hmm. in the beginning when I started, right? It was you know literally searching through an A and R handbook and like emailing a random A and R and like you know an Epic or something, being like, "Hey, my name is Miro. You know, I'm going to be in New York. Can I come see you?" Right, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, to a and is just hitting you up and being like, hey, so-and-so, you know, this is so-and-so from wherever. I'm going to be in Toronto. Let's do a meeting or this or when are you going to be in L.A. or whatever. And that there was a real kind of hunger, I think, on the American side to just, you know, to, to figure out what's going on here and monetize it and, yeah. <laughs> and, and get involved. So that was a major, a major, major shift in that sort of the, the beginnings of the 2010s, right? That. Sure. That kind of period. So I wanted yeah. to bring it back just a little bit and talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the culture of Canadian black music at yeah. that period. That that because you know one of the things, and you and I had a conversation a little bit earlier, and we talked about how you got a chance to really grow and 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 mature in this entertainment industry, while the Toronto scene, especially, which was kind of like the epicenter of mm -hmm. uh, um, hip hop and R and B at that time you got a chance to see that progression with 
the club scene and, and, and how it was being perceived. What did you feel when, as that was progressing, did you see that like, hey, this could be something really special. This could be something that we could celebrate, not just in Canada, but around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, like I said, I grew up in Calgary, and one of the when you're when you're from the West, one of the things that they kind of teach you, like subconsciously, mm -hmm. is to hate Toronto. Not hate is a strong one, but dislike Toronto. You know, like yeah. the West is very anti-Toronto. And it's then like I came out here for summer. It was a summer '98, mm -hmm. and with, I didn't know anybody here. But within like a week, I was like, I love the city. Right? There's there's just something really magical and special to me right. about Toronto, about the way the cultures flowed in Toronto, just the, just the flow and the vibe of the city, especially the downtown. At the time, you know, Toronto was still, I think, a much younger city than mm -hmm. it is right now, like from a cultural, culturally and just like swag and everything about, about the city, which is very, very different then. But it had this potential, right? And, it's, and watching that city kind of grow into its potential, you know, you mentioned the, the, the club space and that, that transition, because, you know, so much of black music is about clubs. Right. That's that's where you hear it. That's where it pops off. That's where all of that and that kind of transition from that, you know, early 2000s period when it was all Richmond and Adelaide Street and Fluid and Red Drink Boutique and that whole kind of that vibe. Then to the King Street, the move to King Street into like the mid 2000s, mm -hmm. you know, and then kind of everything that that happened out, out of there beyond. And we were involved. We had a club um, on, on Bathurst and King for a few years as well. So I got to kind of see that see that piece firsthand but it was always like this city i'm always kind of thinking this city could be so much more and you know and and you as the raptors raptors were kind of experiencing that same thing it's like everything kind of happened in parallel paths right it's like you had the growth of the raptors you had the growth of the music scene you had the growth of the club scene and all this kind of stuff yeah and everything kind of individually just exploded at its, at its own time to the point where all of those things you know are now things that i think are taken seriously internationally Right. right, right. And that, I mean, that shift you were talking about, like the Raptors and entertainment, it seemed to almost blend into the rest of the culture at that time and, and across Canada. You started yeah. seeing a lot of, you know, individuals from the East Coast to the West Coast just really buying into the idea that, hey, this could be something, like you said, this could be something really special. And that's great. And one of the things I, I love that you touched on was the fact that the music grew in with the club scene mm. the fact that you know a lot of the times we talk about um what happens with more indie music or rock music that's more live bands but r&b and hip-hop grows with clubs and and that's with it. the nightlife aspect so the the bigger that nightlife became the bigger that we had uh, that mm -hmm. relationship with. For sure, and, and you look at the tie-in. Sorry to jump in. But you look at the tie-in between like the people that were doing stuff in the club scene and also doing stuff on the entertainment, on the music scene, or on the film scene, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at like Taj and X, and and what they were doing and what they were doing on the club, on the on the club scenes in Carabao and the and the parties, yeah. and then the same thing and the rise in the music and the and the music videos and film and everything, right? So it's like in Toronto, everything during that period of time just felt like it was just also tied in together. Yeah, exactly. So as the industry started growing and we started seeing the sound crossing borders, not just yeah. into the US, but all over the world, do you feel that where we are now today and the industry, do you feel that we are actually at the forefront and just at the beginning or are we in the middle of it and we need to pay more attention to where we're at and actually give more focus, give more credence as Canadians, both mm -hmm. managers. I mean, you have a lot of managers that are in here right now. Um, should we be spending more time and more focus towards nurturing and really uplifting what we have as black and, and, and black excellence and black music? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very, that's a very good question. I think we're, I mean, from when you look at it from the perspective of Canadians making noise internationally, right, and, and and black music by Canadians making noise internationally, I mean, you know, we are we are at the top of that game, right? The weekend just came off playing the Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, Drake's been I don't know whatever the the the, the number was consecutive weeks spent on a Billboard chart or whatever. It's like a kajillion weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, on that level. 
we're at the we're at the apex. I hope we continue to stay at that level, and more newer artists come and, and fill those slots. But what I think is important is something that you kind of you know mentioned and when you're talking about it is what I hope we, we do now is is realize that yeah the excellence we do have in our talent pool and our artists and you know those two are by far not the only ones who've had successes um, at all. There's been you know an arm's length of 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 writers and producers and artists and everything that have that have had success right along with with those two beside them and in in different areas but you know i think it's important for us to recognize that look now it's let's let's build the industry in canada in such a way where we don't need that american cosign or that american it's someone to blow up in america before we here in canada take black music seriously yeah. right because up until now it's still it's still very much has been like okay that's great but what's america saying about it and and i understood you know that that vibe made sense in 2002 2004 2006 when you know toronto was like i always felt like toronto was like the little this little brother to like new york and it was always like mm. you know it had this weird like one-way beef with new york would be like new york's doing this new york's doing that and you know new york was just doing its own thing it didn't really have time to think about what toronto was doing mm -hmm. you know but now that as a city, and I think culturally in terms of what we're doing here as a city, we got our own place in the world stage. And it's not about competing with New York or competing with London. It's just about being Toronto and Toronto having its rightful place on the world stage with a lot of, a lot of those other cities. Let's not look to, oh, did America say this is good enough that we can celebrate it now? Let's celebrate it because we're confident in what we have when we can celebrate it. Agreed, 100%. And I want to talk a little bit about the industry itself because of course we're MMF we're talking about oh. not just the artists but we're talking about mm -hmm. the individuals that work behind the artists so the managers of course uh, but you of course are, are an entertainment lawyer yeah do you see that there's a lack of black entertainment lawyers that work in Canada mm -hmm. and and how can we bridge that gap if you see that there's that lack yeah I mean, I, I'm laughing because I mean that's literally that is one of the things that you know, led me to to be like, okay, we need to do something and start talking to the other, you know, people who ended up kind of founding Advance was, you know, when I came in I think on the music side, I think there was one other black music lawyer um, at the time, Blair Holder, who's, who's no longer practicing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another guy, Paul Riley, who, who kind of came up around the same time as me. He's no longer practicing. And Brian Burks came up around the same time. He's still in the mix, but that was it. And then, you know, when you, it's like you start working and you're like, you know, you're working for three or five years. You're just kind of focused on your own thing. You know, you're not really paying too much attention in terms of what's happening behind you. And then, but at some point you're like, okay, my situation is pretty, is, is good. Let me kind of see, let me look back and see what's happening behind me. And when there's nothing there, right? There was not, there was not a, at the time when I was 10 years in, 12 years in, I couldn't necessarily look back and be like, oh, there's a young black entertainment lawyer who's been practicing for three years, four years. I'm excited to see what they're doing. Right. right? So that was something that was just, okay, we gotta we gotta fix this, you know? And not just in not just in the legal space, but just, you know, across the board in the industry space, right? Where I think a lot of other people working in other parts of the industry were seeing the same thing. We're like, hey, I may be have this position at, at a label. But I can't necessarily look back and, and see who's going to replace me, right, in, right. in eight to ten years. So that was that, – that's something. And hopefully, you know, through through the efforts of Advance and other things, we were able to fill that pipeline because it's not – it really can't be about me as an individual or so-and-so as an individual or you as an – I mean, you know, we're all, we're all doing our own thing and we'll mm -hmm. have our successes. But for the culture and the industry and everything to keep going, it, it requires – a, you know, a, a constant flow of people in the same way that like on an artist level, you need, you need new artists when the old artists age out, you need new business people when the old business people age out. Mm -hmm. So that leads us right into advance. What obviously is the reason why you created it, but what's mm -hmm. the platform? What, what's the purpose to create something like this and what can we do as advance or sorry, as an MMF, mm -hmm and MMF members to help support what Advance is doing right now. Okay. So, I mean, fundamentally, you know, Advance is, it functions on a couple levels, right? I think one of the chief levels 
is as an advocacy, as a unif unification and advocacy mm -hmm. organization for black people who are in the music business, right? So a way for everybody to kind of be like, hey, A, connect, because I think a lot of times, you know, you end up, everybody ends up in their own silo in, in many ways. So this is a way for people to connect, to talk about the issues that matter to everybody, to align on common goals and, mm -hmm. and plans to interact with, you know, the other organizations that are that are out there like MMF, you know, like Factor, like Ontario Creates, Music BC, what have you. Um, and and advocate for black people within within the music industry, right? And so that's one side of the coin and the other side of the coin is, you know, what we were talking about before, it's like the making sure that that pipeline of business people is there because if you don't have qualified black people on the business side, then what's going to ha happen is black artists and black creators are going to suffer. Right. right. Because, you know, e either, either what happens is they've got, they've got a representation that isn't properly qualified to represent their interests properly. If they're, you know, or they may end up with, they may end up with representatives that may not understand all the, you know, all their issues or concerns or this or, or what have you, right? And that that's that's one of the things is that you know if you're gonna if if, if black music is going to generate as much economic value as it does, then it's important that the, that there's representation of, you know all around the table for that, right? So whether that's at the label side, at the booking agency side, at the promoter side, at the publisher side, mm -hmm. you know. That's great. And I love the fact that there's a, a desire for representation. So again, how can we support that from mm -hmm. MF or from a manager standpoint? Are there, um, I, are there suggestions of, of mentorship programs? Is there, what can we do to, to not mm -hmm. just be passive supporters, but more active supporters? Yeah. I mean, it, it's collaboration. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've been thinking about is is doing doing a doing a co event with MMF because managers managers you know next to artists next to creators ma managers probably the next most common job that's out there right because every every creator needs a manager right for the most part right and so you have a lot of managers and a lot of a lot of managers who who care and want to do the best for the clients and 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 see their people win and make money and all of that but may not have learned. You know, there's not like there's not a really. I mean, there's some schools you go to, but for the most part, you know, I think you management is a thing you learn by doing or learn by working with somebody else who's doing. Mm -hmm. Right, those are the best ways to learn as opposed to you know going to a class about it. Mm -hmm. Right, so MMF being invested in, in in the process of passing knowledge down, you know, to new young up and coming managers is a is a way that you can help. Right. And that the and that we can kind of work together and get make sure that the goals that we're trying to do are aligned. Right. So so teaching the next generation and seeing yeah. the same things that a lot of us managers understand and know thanks to you know what we've learned basic basically throughout the industry and also what we've learned as MMF and, and, and as the community and mm. making sure that's being sent over to that next generation. Absolutely. And mm. and I, I agree with that because I think that that is something that will really create more of a sustainable industry because a lot of the time, a lot of managers that start off in our business are just doing it because they're best friends or because yeah. they have to be, happen to be around at that same time. And through sometimes success and sometimes failure, they learn mm -hmm. the most of how our business works. We want to change that, and we're hoping that we can do that same thing with Advance and, and with the individuals that join Advance, young managers and young individuals, professionals who are trying to get involved. So that's great. One thing I wanted to leave with you or, or ask you uh, before mm -hmm. we get into the Q&A is what do you see in the next, of course, you know, we've, there was a lot of upheaval of course, uh, last year with you know, Black Lives Matter, both in the U.S. and right. here in Canada. Uh, we've also seen, you know, great progression here in Canada and, and the uh, institution of advance and other institutions and other organizations. What do you see for our next few years? What's the landscape for us? And 
what can we do to make sure that we're not passive about it and that we take a more uh, impactful stance towards making a difference? I think it's, you know, it, it... It's a, it's just about being active, right? So, I, you know, on our, on the advance end, you know, I'm very excited that on Monday we're going to be announcing our executive director, right? So mm. that's, that's something that, Great. you know, for, for a long time, cause we just, you know, we started the organization in June when we are, we've been talking about doing it earlier and then COVID happened. It was just like, okay, nobody's going to have time for this. Like no one's going to have the bandwidth to care mm -hmm. whether we think it's important or not. And then, you know, when the unfortunate murder of George Floyd happened, it just seemed like all of a sudden it was like, okay, this is, this is the time to, to put this out. But it, then it was really about, okay, let's, let's roll. We just kind of hit the ground running and have just been running in terms of like getting our deal with the city sorted out, getting our deal with the city and slate sorted out, getting. Um, Which is a big thing. Yeah. Again, and congratulations on that. That was a big moment. Thank you. To really see yeah. that organization between the city, slate music, and some of the major yeah. labels coming together and saying, "Hey, we support you." So again, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, that was that was really powerful, and it felt felt really good to know that that that, that support was there. Um, and then just kind of running, you know, and, and trying to get pull, pull some membership together, pull some people together, pull some committees together, and trying to get the ED process rolling. And you know, at the same time, everybody's got full time jobs and, and lives, so it's um, it, it, it feels good to know that okay. You know, now we'll have somebody who will be, you know, full time, probably full time plus, um, you know, working working on this and really helping advance. Sorry, the the pun, but advance our goals, right? Because one of the one of the things that's been great about this is just seeing how passionate and invested people are, right? right. So that you know, everybody, yourself included, man. You know, we're coming every week to the subcommittee meetings, right? And, and we're spending spending an hour two hours talking about things, setting up plans. And it's just, a, you know, the follow through on the follow through on those plans, the initiatives, We've got a lot of exciting initiatives, community based initiatives, mentor based initiatives, industry based initiatives. And it'll take, you know, because of COVID, it'll take, uh, it's not gonna be the smoothest ne path necessarily mm -hmm. for, some, for some of this stuff, but definitely the, the passion is there and the, the intent is there. And that's what I'm excited about is, is, to, is to see all that transform, transform into action. You know, even, even in, the, in the short period of time that we've been around in conjunction, you know, with our efforts and working, you know, particularly the people who, who work at the major labels that are part of Advance, there's definitely been a major uptick in the amount of Black people who've been hired, you know, to positions within, within those, that, that part of the a industry. A really big statement, right? a really big statement. Yeah. So, Mira, I can't thank you enough for taking the time yeah, to really, you know, talk and, and, and share the information of what we're doing. Again, this isn't about talking about what's wrong, but this was just more sharing information of the great aspects of what's happening in our culture, in our community, today, yesterday, and what's going to happen for us in the future. And so we really appreciate the time. Um, I know that yeah, we have a lot of you here that might have some questions. Would love to hear some of the questions. Uh, I see Ty wants to know about the robe. Ty, as you know, <laughs> it's a moment of black excellence. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dress for excellence. This is, a, this is excellence outfit. Okay, that's what we're doing here. Uh, but the question that we had from Andrea is that, what do you think is the key characteristics for leadership in the music business? I'll let you start, with that, Miro. No, okay. Okay. Um. I think you need to be decisive, right? You know, the music business moves fast, right? And you 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 gotta you gotta be willing to make a decision and and live or die by that decision, mm. right? And you know, you're not gonna be right all the time. And when you're wrong, you gotta learn from why you were wrong, and hopefully not be wrong for the same reasons the next time. Mm. But you gotta make you gotta make the decisions. If you're gonna spend, and I think that's that way with 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 all business. It's you know, if you're gonna spend a bunch of time humming and hawing about it, or I don't know, should we do this? Should we do that? The, op the opportunity just passes by, and your ability to to lead or to learn from that situation also passes by, right? So that's that's also important. Is you're not gonna be right all the time, but at least when you're when you're wrong, you you learn from from, from that from that piece. I agree. That 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 would be my 
I take what you're saying and move just a, and pivot just a little bit from that in the sense that I believe the most important characteristic you can have is to be daring. You know that yes. a lot of the times if you're trying to lead something, most people are not going to agree with you. Actually, most people will stifle you. They'll try and tell you, hey, yeah, yeah, we've tried that already or mm, I don't really think it's going to work. To really be a leader in what we're doing in this business, you have to know you're going to be alone a lot of the time. And be okay with that. And know that at the end of the day, if you stay true as like what you're saying, if you have all your facts, you know where you're going, it will work out in the end. And being confident in that is really important. We also have another question that asks, can you talk about a time when you experienced racism at work and how you handled that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could start with that one. I mean, you, you know, I, I think on for, for on my end, it's, ne it's never necessarily been something direct, but it's always, you know, it's always that, and I got to I got to figure out the, a better way of kind of framing this. This question no, will go. You know, but it's like the in the beginning, I think what it is, it, it's the struggle to be seen, right? It's the struggle to be seen and recognized and taken and taken seriously, where there's that feeling of somebody looking at you and being like, mm, you don't matter to me because I don't deal in hip hop. What do I need you for? Right. That kind of that thing. And that the 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 the, the sort of getting put in a, in a certain box because of your race and, and not, like I said, not being taken seriously. And, you know, that that <laughs> that took a while. There, you know, it definitely took a while for that to break through that. And then at some point. People are like, oh, shit, you're still here. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. That I understand <laughs> all too well. The idea of, oh, wait a minute, you're still around. Yeah. yeah. Of course I am. Why wouldn't yeah. I be? That's it. And I think, you know, when you're talking about, and I think, look, one of the things that is important to me, you know, when we're talking about black excellence, right, I think the the reality is right now, I think, just to often just to exist in the music business and be black, you, the level that you have to be at is excellence, right? But that's, I don't think that, you know, excellence is great, but not everybody's gonna be excellent. Most people are just gonna be good or pretty good or even great. And I think that's fine. You know, I, I think that that is, that's probably a more universal bar for everybody else, right? It's like, there's gonna be some people who are excellent and are gonna get, get to some other a higher level, but you can't the, the bar just to get in the room can't be excellence, you know, because it's not that's not I don't, I don't think that's what it is across the board. I'm, I'm with you on that. It's for me, the. Can I think of a time when I experienced racism? It was it, it's that same thing. It's oh, you're still here. Do I think it was racism? Not necessarily. I think it's also about experience. And yep. I think the shared experiences or or helping the individuals who are starting off, that doesn't really happen a lot for indiv uh, individuals who start off in hip hop or R&B. Yeah. And to me, that's a problem. Uh, for example, the amount of knowledge that you and I already possess when it comes to Canadian musicians and the grants and the opportunities that we have, thanks to Factor, thanks to Ontario Music Fund, those in those things were not shared to us. These are things that we had to learn because we were involved with people who were doing that. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, that information wasn't really dispelled and, and sent and dispersed to the individuals that look like us. That to me was a problem. And that's something mm -hmm. that I counter every time I can. Any individual I speak to, be it an artist, a label, a manager, a publisher, that I understand, hey, you don't you don't get this? Here's all the inf in information you need. That's what we're doing with MMF. We're making sure that there's as much information as possible. We're going to underserved communities, being it BIPOC communities, being it LGBTQ, be it women, to understand that, hey, there's, there's an opportunity for you, for your clients, to make a, a great and sustainable business. That's mm -hmm. something that, to me, is not just racism, but it's, it's definitely from a lack of an experience. The next question that we have is, what would you say to inspire other black music professionals to stay strong in these times and stay focused? Um, I would say 
if this is what you're passionate about, this is the best, this is the best time for you, right? You know, this is, there's, if you want to go back in history, there's not a better time in, in the history of Canadian music to be doing what you want to be doing than mm. right now, right? You know, in, in the sense that the industry, you're, you're stepping into the a situation where the industry, you know, everybody who comes next has the benefit of the people who came before you know we had the benefit of the people who came before us and they had the benefit of the people who, who came before them so all of that is there and, and and knowing you know especially now as we're working on the infrastructure that we are with advance that there are people who are willing to spend time with you educate you answer your questions give you advice be like don't you know Go down this road. This is a good road. That other road, mm, you might, you know, you might end up in a place you don't want to go when you go down that mm. road. You know, all of that kind of, all of that kind of thing. I think that's that that's valuable. You know, perspective um, always helps. You know, and I think, yeah, not not getting caught up in 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 kind of spinning around in circles and getting distracted. Right, having having the having the focus on what you what the long term goal is that you're trying to agreed. Do. Perseverance for me. Just mm. know that the individuals that came before you persevered in their own fights and in their own battles, and they're here today. COVID is definitely not something that any of us has ever experienced. However, we all have that fortitude. It's there. It's instilled in us. It's in our history. It's in the individuals that are around us, and we can move through that. So perseverance for me is the advice that I would give to inspire young black music professionals. What advice, another question is to you, Miro, what advice do you have regarding finding and connecting with black creatives and industry members for someone who comes from a place where there aren't as many black people? The internet. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yep. You know, I mean, that's like, I'm joking in it, but I'm not, I mean, you know, that the beauty of the internet is, is, is that, is that communities exist outside of your, your physical, your physical location. And, and obviously, you know, community is, is, is much better built in, in, in a physical space where you can interact with, with people in a full, in a full three dimensional way. But, you know, if, if there's anything that I think if there are any skills that we will all learn out of this COVID experience, is a better ability to build communities without needing three-dimensional space because it's three-dimensional space has been taken mm. away from us for you know a year and a half right so that's it because there are and and know that for every person who's, who's who has that feeling like you do you know you wherever and 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 i know you are but i'm not going to out you um you know where where, where you where you're right. living um and you've got You've got that feeling. Know that there are other people in other cities, you know, in in North Bay or in Fort McMurray or in you know Prince George or wherever that are feeling the same way and are and are feeling as much, if not more, isolated and are all looking to build that community. So, you know, try it as it sounds. I think community is where you build it. You know, with who, and with who you build it. I think you said it best. Uh, let's move into the next question. Are there any key things an artist would need to let go of in order to thrive in the industry? I feel like you're, you're the manager, man. You should, you, you, you take this one. <laughs> I think you could take this one too. What would they need to let go of for me is their ego. You need to yeah. understand yeah. that this industry continues to evolve, change. You can't think that just because your music is great and your friends like it, that it's going to do something. That's the equivalent of thinking, I've got a restaurant, I've got good food. If I open the door, people will walk in. It's impossible, mm -hmm. right? Our business yeah. is a business. And to attract individuals to come in, you need to have something that is tangible to the people that you want to attract. I didn't say if you want to be famous or a superstar, or you need to do antics. I didn't say that. I said the individuals that you want to attract, you need to know how to get to them. That is the thing that a lot of artists don't do. They think that just because the music is good, it'll reach them. 
Mm-hmm. That's not how it works. So I would yeah. say let go of your ego and figure out what is it that the people that I want to reach, where do they hang out? What do they listen to? What do they read? What do they watch? And from there, you might get a better idea of how to reach them with your music and who you are. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Right. And I would also I would add to that, it's kind of the same thing as expectation. You know, I think the impatience that comes with, why am I not famous now? Why am I not famous now? Right? And understanding that even for even for the artists that look like they're an overnight success, I was still probably five or six mm. years behind that, you know, for, for a lot of them, right? When you when you kind of dig dig deeper, right? It's, very few artists are, li- are literally an overnight success. The, the thing that I love is when I talk to some artists and they go, I don't do interviews. Or I don't do, I won't talk to this small blogger or this, you know, small fan because Drake doesn't do it or because The Weeknd doesn't do interviews or because, you know, so on and so forth. I'm like, do you look at what they did to come up? If you want to look at the amount of interviews that Drake did on MySpace with small little bloggers or individuals, it would blow your mind. He wasn't worried about how it looked because at the time, He was just trying to get his message out there. So this idea, and again, it comes down to ego, is stop looking at what that person does as, well, it's not Rolling Stones, it's not the star or whatever. And just look about getting your message out there to individuals who are willing to listen. And then from there, maybe it'll turn into something else. We have a really great question that I want to get into. Mm -hmm. If you have a concept or an idea that you believe could help create and actionable items to address breaking down some of the racial barriers in our industry. Who or how do you go about getting to the table with advance? To that table, sorry, with advance. So I think the easiest thing to do would be to email us at uh, connect at advancemusic.org as an initial, you know, once we, Oh, once we announce our ED on on Monday, then you know that's a, that becomes a direct person that uh, that people can can reach out to. But for now, that's the that's sort of the general email address. You know, we invite you to become a member of Advance. Go to www.advancemusic.org, sign up there. Um, then you know you'll be on our mailing list, newsletters, all that. If you want, if if you want to play a larger role and be more involved. Um, there's subcommittees in various areas that people can be a part of. So if this is an, an area that you're passionate about, there are definitely many ways to get involved. But I think as, as an initial thing, go to the website and you know, send an email to connect at advanced music. Mira, I appreciate you for what you're doing in the entertainment law space. I appreciate you what you're doing with advance and creating this organization that's really helping moving forward initiatives of black creatives and executives in Canada. And I appreciate you as a black man here in Canada and what we're trying to do. So thank you again for being here with us, for being with the members here at MMF. And uh, thank you guys also for listening. The questions were fantastic. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I send it over to Gab and to Andrea. Let us know where you guys want to go from here. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you and your robe. Bro, I'm trying to just look the way that I'm supposed to. I got to look the part. If this is, I got a little champagne, got a little, you know, I got to do it for y'all. I got to do it for y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. That was like, I feel like if we could clap, but it's all like online. So thank you very much, Miro and Jermaine. Um, that was yeah. really insightful. I wish we had way more time to have this conversation, but um, I definitely feel like a lot of us got some takeaways and that's really, you know, what it's about. And I got I have a good vibe and that's really what tonight is really about is having a good vibe. Um, we are now going to get into a spoken word piece by Rise Edutainment. And um, I'm going to, I think Andrea is going to bring them on to the screen anytime now. Um, but first, we're going to hear a, a couple of words from, yeah, Arise, somebody from the Rise team. And hello, it's nice to see Hi. another here. 
thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I'm not going to waste any time and I, I will let you get it right into it. Awesome. Thank you for um, having us. Uh, my name is Anastasia DeLeon. I'm one of the uh, project managers at Rise Edutainment. Um, and for those of you who don't know about Rise, um, it's a community that started uh, nine years ago and essentially it was to create a safe space for young people and artists to be able to express themselves positively. And uh, Randall J, the founder, he recognized that Scarborough, I'm from Scarborough and we didn't have anything like this and he recognized that um, this type of space was missing and he was able to create this community for us to come together and build. So nine years later, um, we've recognized that not only did we need to provide this space for them, but also that artists wanted to know more about, um, they needed more education, um, they wanted to know more about uh, developing their business acumen, more about the art um, industry in general, as well as just developing themselves as uh, a professional artist. So we've done things like the Edutainment Summit, which is a three-day summit dedicated to um, helping artists bridge the gap from emerging to professional, as well as other uh, workshops that provide not only um, artist tools, but just from a holistic lens, wellness, um, and just an educational piece um, in general. And um, now we also offer the booking agency. So we're able to um, take these artists and put them out into real professional situations and be able to get them paid. So um, that is Rise in a nutshell. If you guys do want to know more about it, please uh, visit our website at www.riseedutainment.com. I've also put the, um, our Instagram in my profile. So at Rise underscore EDT and um, definitely connect with us. I don't want to take up too much time, but yes, please um, look us up. And I want to um, introduce one of our artists. Um, his name is Troy Penny and a very, very talented young man. I've had the pleasure of seeing him perform many times and he always blows me away. So just a little bit about Troy. Um, he's a spoken word poet whose only goal is to inspire and challenge those who listen to his work. He enjoys speaking on issues that many individuals experience from a different perspective. His style comes from hip hop culture, which is why a few of his pieces have a rhythmic rhyming flow to them. And ultimately, Troy just wants his art to create change in one person's life. So without further ado, I give you Troy Penny. Thank you very much, Anastasia. You're welcome. Um, I just want to uh, express the impact that Rise has had on, on me personally as an artist. You know. Whenever I go to Rise, I always feel like there's a sense of community and it's it's a safe space for me to express myself creatively. And I have a lot of friends who are trying to, who would be trying to, you know, get into um, just performing and stuff. And I always point them towards Rise because it's always a, a welcoming place to, um, to be at. So today I just want to share a piece called Found and I hope it touches somebody today. <clears throat> You know, I was 22 years old when I first felt lost. Like, like my purpose in life was non-existent. I had been waking up every day knowing that at night I'll be going to bed further from my life's destiny. The thought killed me because I knew deep down inside I had the ability to do great things. I just, I just couldn't find it. You see, sometimes lost means let's observe some things. Keyword, observe. To observe effectively means to slow down. It means you may need to come to a complete stop in order to fully grasp what's in front of you. At the crossroads, we are met with many choices, decisions that will impact the rest of our journey. So I ask you, what path will you take? You wanna chase after your passion with everything you've got inside you, even when you've hit the bottom of your tank's reserve, or you wanna give up on our dreams, find a comfortable job where you're never happy, never satisfied, never challenged, because existing without purpose will always be the path of least resistance. Hey, listen, center yourself. Calm the worry. Breathe. Permit your eyes to color black 
Allow your heart to speak. Let your mind wander in the pasture of possibility. When you're ready, call it back and ask what it has in its hands. It will show you. The conscience has a debilitating condition called truth. It's what plagues you now. It's what keeps you up at night. It's what you need to face if you ever want to be cured, but you're still salty, so you dash your pearls before swine instead of understanding its value, young one. Find your purpose again, your path for your life, the one you discovered as a child. The one you'd always run to after the world chopped you down. It walked through the woods while she was slumbering. It removed the dead leaves around your trunk. It ran its hands across your essence and found a pulse. It carefully carved you from oak and breathed life into you. So why haven't you cut the strings of your puppeteer parents yet? They lied to you about the realities of life. No one knows its length, nor the secrets hidden within itself. It whispered in your air, you are capable. You have purpose. You are found. Your destiny cannot be destroyed because it is hidden deep within the chambers of the temple within you. It refuses to be torn asunder. Now, now at 26, I can't tell you that I got it all figured out. What I can tell you is that this path feels most familiar. I was born to do this, built to be great. Bread a beast. Familiarity is destiny's compass. So use it, not as a guide to traverse the cavern of comfort. Instead, go in the opposite direction, the one where distress dwells and worry wanders, where uncertainty permeates the air and you are dying to breathe. You cannot advance towards achievements and accomplishments without an intimate understanding of ineptitude and inadequacy. So run towards failure with reckless abandon because it is the beacon of success and as you go think of who you're doing this for if the person that comes to mind is yourself you've already lost because self is a dangerous being self can be mean self can hurt Self can sabotage because self knows in its current comfortable state, it's not prepared to be something other than self. That's why self needs to be disciplined because self will always control those who fail to control self. Ain't it funny? How we hate what we don't understand. So when we see something within ourselves we don't recognize, we destroy it instead of, we destroy it before it has a chance to flourish into something of substance. Don't snap. Fix that. Instead of thinking of how to build yourself up, think of how you can reinforce those around you. Because in this twisted thing called life, it's always hurricane season and too many homes are not built to cold. They waver when wind blows. So how do you expect them to survive the gale force winds? Help them. That way, you'll never run out of work. And you'd always be surrounded by the fortresses that you have constructed. Listen, I know the ropes because I've hung on them through many fights. I cling to hope because that's what kept me going through the nights. Our worst enemies can be our own memory. So focus on the task at hand and forget about them. Young one, do not let anyone sweep you off your feet. You are not dirt. You are the broom. And in regards to tomorrow, do not wait for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. That was, uh, that was very, very, very powerful. And um, that was, wow, I'm a little bit speechless. So I'm going to read out.
some comments in the chat because I really appreciate the emphasis, the power, the love, the passion that went into that, the excellence, the black excellence that came from your soul and went into that. Thank you, Troy. That was like, that was perfect. This night has been perfect. <laughs> um, wow. Let's see. Dude is on some next level stuff. Clap, clap, fire, fire, bang, bang. <laughs> You're the you're the broom, someone said. Sweep, sweep. <laughs> um, all right, guys. We are going to get back into um some networking. Um, and I guess we're gonna go to the floor. I just want to th say thank you to uh, Miro um, from Advance. Thank you to Jermaine. Thank you to everybody who helped put this together. Um, to everybody who's still here hanging on. To Rise, the whole Rise team, um, and to Troy. Thank you. I hope you guys. I hope, I, like, I hope you get some some gigs from from tonight. Please make sure you hit him up. He's wow. That was phenomenal. That really touched me, and I'm sure it did a lot of other people. Many blessings to everybody. Let's go back to the floor. Let's get some our networking on. Feel free to talk to everybody. Feel nice. Take a little break. And also, there's a few other events going on tonight. Um, songwriters in Canada, I believe. Sorry, don't hate me, but. Tomorrow, Advance is hosting a really, really intimate and interesting um, um, video series. Um, it's starting with an amazing woman who is part of our MMF family. Her name is Kat, and she is going to be kicking off their series. It starts at 1 p.m. tomorrow, I believe. So make sure you go and check out Advance on YouTube. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys at the floor. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon.